when people feel loved, it raises the bar of what they're willing to accept. At the ultimate level, true love is when you care deeply for somebody else and you want their good. The love we're talking about is something that unless you've, unless you've experienced it, you really don't even have a clue as to what that really means. It's never based on what you're going to get from someone. It's never based on how they necessarily make you feel. It's like the acceptance of who you are, which allows you to be vulnerable in that space and be you, good, bad, ugly, whatever. When you are actively pushing yourself to act, think, and act in love towards others from whom you're not expecting to receive in return anything, you yourself are growing. And as a matter of fact, it is the most important work for which our soul came into this world. Welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast, episode 43. Um, I promise this episode won't be about grief or death, not a lot of tears, I hope. Um, for those of you who join in with us weekly, you're familiar with um, my father's process. He has now passed away. And um, and I've just got lots of thoughts, lots of processing. But um, it's interesting because we've spoken a lot about how we felt when your parents passed, especially Karen, who passed eight months ago. And um, and I've shared this with you. I don't think I've shared it publicly, but she taught me a lot about how to not really fear death. Like I think before that experience with her and being with her when she transitioned, I avoided death altogether. The idea of it, the discomfort of it, going close to it. Um, there were probably still that residue of the thoughts I had about, you know, things like that being kind of contagious energetically. And uh, and she she passed with such grace and almost joy even uh, that I um, that I don't fear it and I think she really helped prepare me for helping my father transition um, which basically was over a two week period I mean a seven year struggle with Alzheimer's but a two week period in the hospital but I was shocked to be met with feelings of almost elation when he passed. And I remember that night on Friday night, I came home that afternoon. I said, you know, I, I feel really strange. I don't think this is the reaction I'm supposed to have. But I think I was so tapped into his feelings um, and his process, you know, it was all about making him feel comfortable and safe and fearless in his transition that even when he passed away, I think I was connecting to what he must feel like being free from a body that limited him so much. And I really felt that his soul could soar in a beautiful way. And uh, God, I'm just not getting a lot of sleep. There are really <laughs> a lot of people on the other side are visiting me in my sleep last night, right? I told you three people. One of them was my father, um, spent the evening with me, uh, but he was happy. And we were listening to a song actually from my childhood in New Orleans and he was relaxing or we listening to it. It was very- What was the song? Um, yeah, it was, uh, Bill Withers. Which one? Just the two of us. <laughs> uh, that, and then, uh, the other one that reminds you of childhood, that's his as well as sailing. I think that's what it's called. Sailing takes us away. Anywho, so today we're going to talk about something more uplifting, but it actually is connected to something I realized that my father taught me and I only really fully understood it after he passed away. I remember when you shared it, it yeah. felt so true. And um, I think that's right by, I, I think I forget where we were, but one of the times you shared it with a group of people, and I mentioned that, you know, it's it's a very, I, I feel it's a very important point that shouldn't be overlooked. Well, it kind of came to me like a veil was lifted from my eyes, which has been my experience of, of my dad's passing, really like, oh my God, how much, we all fall prey to the illusions of our five senses and of this world. And of course we've taught it, but to actually live it and then be able to see how it, how it is actualized in your life all the time is profound. And I hope it's this life-changing experience, but I hope this change will stay with me forever. 
Um, but I think that if we asked any of our listeners, do you believe that uh, you're a loving person, right? What would most people answer? Of course. A lot of people say yes, yes. That they're a loving person, yes, right? Um, but then the question is, then why do so many people have trouble receiving love? And I think that I understood this so fully after my father passed that, you know, in the seven years that he was struggling with Alzheimer's and he was forgetting who he was, I also, not fully realizing, was forgetting him as well. I think that when you no longer create new memories with people, and I think also when the person in front of you looks familiar but doesn't really resemble who they were throughout the entirety of of your life, it's easy almost to, I think, to protect ourselves, you know, to remove yourself, to not really connect to them. And again, forget a lot of the experiences that you had, especially the positive ones. So when he passed away, it was like this flood of emotion and memories from my childhood. And I, I felt him so completely as he was in the totality of who he was, not plagued by the disease. And the biggest epiphany that I had was that, you know, in all honesty, I felt like I was able to choose such a great partner, you, um, who could love me unconditionally and, and really a healthy partner, right? And where did I, how was I able to find that or receive that? And we can look into many different ways, but at the core, I thought my whole life until two weeks ago, that, you know, as much as my parents, um, as much as there was love there in the relationship, it wasn't a healthy model. There was a lot of blaming and judgment and um, misuse of words and just, you know, a lot of things. And I remember thinking growing up, well, I'm going to choose a partner and I'm going to be a different kind of partner than the model that I have in front of me. So I thought, you know, my parents taught me, but they taught me something that I didn't want to model. I only realized again in seeing him in his totality, that was like the gift of sight that I got after he passed. Um, I realized that I was able to receive love and know what that feels like in a healthy way and not settle for less because my father had given that to me. Can I cry a little bit? <laughs> but he say had, that again because it's I think I think it's so profound and both and beautiful. Because of growing up you know, and I've written it in different ways. And I, I think I understood it on a small level, but, you know, no matter what I did or how I harmed myself or, you know, with anorexia, you know, asking him to hike the Grand Canyon with me in one day to the bottom and from the top to the bottom back up again, you know, he never judged me. I was allowed to be vulnerable completely with him, show him all of me, right? Even the most flawed parts. And, all I received in return was his adoration. It was never anything less than unconditional love. And because I knew what that felt like, and I am able to receive it, I was able to seek that in a partner and also receive that from everybody else in my life and not settle for anything less. That is a huge, it was a huge aha moment for me. And as you said, I was in a, I was with some people, right? We were, I was, you know, in those, that week after and, and I shared this idea because I had that epiphany and then different people went around the room sharing why they can't receive love. I mean, I think I asked the question, um, which I'll share, but I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, no. So when you said that, to me, what that really clarified is how important it is for each one of us to be giving love to people. Now, of course, to your children, to your friends, but really to even people outside that circle. Why is it so important? Like you said, because when people feel loved, it raises the bar of what they're willing to accept. Mm -hmm. So like you said, when in this case, when your father gave you love, it made you understand that in a partner, you want somebody who loves you at least as much as that. You will not accept somebody who loves you less than that. Had you not had a father who loved you in that way, it's possible you would have been you would have been willing to accept much less love from a partner. And certainly with our children, the reason it's so important to give them love is so that when they grow up and they choose a partner, and even they choose a partner in business or they choose a partner anywhere, you know, even choosing a doctor, choosing a lawyer, right? Often 
and, they, and it's just kind of you see people who are willing to be. I don't want to use the word abuse, right? But but be told what to do, right? We'll never sort of um, uh, question a doctor or a lawyer, right? That whole psychological acceptance, I think, a lot of it foundationally has to do with whether they were or were not given love, whether they they do or do not feel that they've received and deserving to receive, and therefore the bar. The more love you give somebody else, the higher their bar rises. To what they're willing and will accept from other people. And so, by the way, though, I want to because as you were speaking, I want to clarify. My father didn't um, favor me. It's not that he, you know, because a lot of I think women often don't find a partner because nobody can match, you know, how their father loved them. This was a very healthy, balanced love, and he loved my sisters exactly the same. My father was a man that, you know, he saw our flaws. It just. It, it scared him, if anything, right? All he wanted for each of us equally was that we would live happy, fulfilled lives. And he wanted it as much for us as he wanted it for himself, right? It was that pure and unadulterated. And the relationship wasn't codependent, it was interdependent. We equally, you know, relied and and uh, relished in that sharing of love, right? So I think that's yeah. a really important point yeah. because it wasn't this kind of like, and by the way, I made a conscious choice to ma- to marry somebody who was very different than my father in many, many ways. This one part, though, the truest, most pure part is where you both have that commonality for me. Right. And again, I think for our listeners, this understanding of both the importance of giving love and also being able to receive, because we know, unfortunately, there are people who are not able to receive, who see themselves as able to give love, not able to receive for whatever reasons, and they're not willing or not able to receive love. But again, the power of that, what it does, again, is that it sets a bar for your children, for your friends. I mean, we're talking about actually somebody we know um, who allows themselves not to be, again, they might think that they're being loved, but really not accepting, not receiving enough love in their relationship. And why? Again, because Maybe, maybe they never got to a point in their lives, whether it's their parents or some or friends or whatever places that they were receiving or not receiving love, that didn't raise the bar high enough. Well, the interesting conversation happened because a lot of people around the room was talking about people that they work with and that this person is struggling because they never received love in their childhood. This one never, and it, it started really with, and I want to go into that a little bit later about attachment styles, right? It's really important to create that bond at the very beginning with a parent. Um, but as we went around the room, then the the friends were, you know, they started sharing their own experience. And one person said that he only knew love according to his childhood definition of what being a man looked like, which I didn't even understand. Explain what it, being. Explain it. Well, he was saying that, well, he was confused, basically. Okay. He understood that too. if you, he was still confused okay. um, in his 50s, but that he understood that uh, if he felt like a man, I guess, macho and strong and um, stoic, that was the definition of love. So anything, so there's no vulnerability in that, right? That's what he understood love to be from how he got feedback growing up. Um, and by the way, I was confused by what he said too. I encouraged him to actually go back to find what that really means to be a man. And what is it that you're doing in your life today? Um, you know, who do you want to be? Not this, like, I think it's kind of like, you know, if you look at the Marlboro man, right, on a horse and this and that, you have like this. I have to do with love. It. It's just the idea of you're only worthy of receiving love if you're manly, if you're this strong kind of provider uh-huh. type. Very complicated. Okay. <laughs> um, another woman said she didn't even have a framework to receive love from her, from how she grew up. And another one found that it was easy for him to give love as that's where he had control. But receiving love was nerve wracking because he thought he was powerless in that dynamic, which I thought was really fascinating. Right, because he right. I remember he said because if he allows himself to be receiving love, that could be taken away. Mm-hmm. So I guess in order not to fall to that possibility, that he hurt. would rather not not receive love. Yeah, again, complicated. Very complicated. But again, I, I do want to underscore the the foundational point, which is to our listeners, to us give as much love as possible because that will keep raising the bar for your children for your friends so if you have a friend who who for whatever reason is lacking in what they have received in their life in in the way of love the more you can give to them the more you're setting them up for every area of their lives 
to not accept less than that. So it's a really, really. Yeah, because yeah, the know. word love, it's like it's thrown around so often. Right. And, and in terms, we're not even talking. We're not talking about romantic love. We're talking about love. Because, in the because by the way, form. because romantic love, and I'd like to share something about this. But romantic love can actually has many elements that are not true love. Because at the ultimate level, true love is when you care deeply for somebody else and you want their good. That that's that's I think as much as you want your own, but to yes. do that you have to be healthy within yourself. Right. Of course, of course, you have to have love for yourself. You can't love another person unless you have that love for yourself. But but true love is when you have love for somebody else, and therefore you desire for them to have good. If you can give it, if somebody else can give it, it's not connected or attached to what you receive back from that person. So it's not reciprocal necessarily. Mm-hmm. So, so true love is 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 the thought and brought into action of of desiring good for another person. Um, so, way, so if, if I look... think I, I think because so many of us attach the concept of love to romantic love, um, we often have the wrong ideas about love, the wrong expectations right. for sure. And if you look even at, you know, we think that. Uh, Every, every child receives love when they're born. In fact, many are not wanted, right? We know so many children are damaged because they never received love when they were born. They were, they were rejected. So this idea, again, I don't want to, because the word love actually bothers me. I wish there was like a stronger word for love because the love we're talking about is something that unless you've, unless you've experienced it, you really don't even have a clue as to what that really means. And that's really what I want. I want to bring that out. So it's it's not um, it's never based on what you're going to get from someone. It's never based on how they necessarily make you feel. It's like the acceptance of who you are, which allows you to be vulnerable in that space and be you, good, bad, ugly, whatever. It, it's that. It's everything, really. Right. So, I'd like to go a little bit in depth into what I think is is foundational in both being able to understand what love is and what it isn't. So, um, so M. Scott Peck, who I've mentioned in previous podcasts, The, the Road Less Traveled. I should always break out into song in my head when we do a podcast. You do? I hate the song, What is Love, Baby? Oh, really? <laughs> so, <laughs> what I think is important, I know for me it is, to, to understand the foundational reasons that we make mistakes about love. So, the idea is this, and this is based on psychology and, and, uh, and on science, what's called ego boundaries, ego boundaries, and how they become developed. So, when we're born, we don't see, and this is really interesting in many ways, a difference between us and anybody else. We do not see a separation between ourselves and others. What, to what age, you know? Yes, until around what it starts breaking down from one to two, and it actually continues all the way till adult adulthood. So what what that means is that the child, a baby, believes that both there and and that what that brings to is the the thought of omnipotence. So a baby's born, he wants to eat, the mother feeds him. A baby's born, he's tired, the mother puts him to bed. He is not even psychologically able to separate his mother's body mm-hmm. from his own. Like as far as he's concerned, he's everything, uh-huh. and everything is for him. And therefore, he wants to. When he, when the, when the, when the trees move, he's moving. When his hand moves, the world is moving. So he, there is that sense, and every baby has this. That there is no ego boundary between a baby and the world around him or her. And then. As the baby grows, even towards age two, he starts to realize, hey, not every time I cry do I get taken care of. There are times my mother doesn't feed me when I'm hungry. There are right, these disappointments, one can call them, but, but the sense of the world is not all mine, and I'm not omnipotent, and, and not everything I want happens to me right away. And he or she begins realizing that there's a difference between me and even my mother. There's a difference between me and the world. And that is called the the ego boundary. So we begin to build around ourselves a sense that I am separate from you, and I am separate from the world. And that, again, continues through adulthood. And I'd like to point out a few things. One, that 
the ego boundaries that we develop, that wall between me and you, that, that wall between me and everybody else in the world, also, as that begins b- being built up, also what begins coming down is the sense of, I can do anything. The omnipotence and the ego boundary have an opposite effect. So when the, the ego boundary gets built up stronger, the sense of the ability of the individual to control anything, to do anything, also begins to to crumble. So I'd like to read a little bit from 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 the book A Road Less Traveled. Gradually, so he explains H one two three again. This begins to crumble, and, and well, the, the sense of omnipotence begins to crumble, and the sense of the the self, right, the ego boundary begins to be built. Even the, so. At a certain age, three, four, you know, that's when kids, why are they into superheroes, right? Because they believe they are a superhero, because oh, they cool. still sense that they're omnipotent. So this is the world of Superman and, and Captain Marvel. Ah. Yet gradually, even the superheroes are given up. And by the time of mid-adolescence, young people know that they are individuals, confined to the boundaries of their flesh and the limits of their power each one a relatively frail and impotent organism, existing only by cooperation within a group of fellow organisms called society. Within this group, they are not particularly distinguished, yet they are isolated from others by their individual identities, boundaries, and limits. So that's where we get to, right? And that's called the ego boundary. But most of us feel our loneliness Right? What, what, what happens with it? When you, when you believed when you were a child, when you were a baby, that you, you weren't lonely because everything is you. You're not, but, but through the sense of, by, by, as you build, as we build the ego boundaries, then that's when you start feeling uh, alone. And we yearn to escape from behind the walls of our individual identities to a condition in which we can be more unified with the world outside of ourselves. The experience of falling in love allows us in this escape, temporarily. Mm -hmm. So what happens when we fall in love? The essence of the phenomenon of falling in love is a sudden collapse of a section of an individual's ego boundaries. Mm, Interesting. That's what happens when, when we fall in love. And again, we'll see what the problem with that, but that's what happens. Permitting one to merge his or her own identity with that of another person. The sudden release of oneself from oneself the explosive pouring out of oneself into the beloved, and the dramatic uh, removal of loneliness accompanying this collapse of ego boundaries is experienced by most of us as ecstatic. And that's what happened, and that's why we get so excited about falling in love, because finally, I'm not alone. Finally, I could be at least one with one other person, and my ego boundaries become diminished. And by the way, what happens when the ego boundaries go down? My omnipotence comes back. The sense, right, and it's true, right? When a person's certainly often initially in love, oh, we can do anything together, right? When they break up, oh, we can't do anything, right? So it's very interesting. I want to underscore that fact that as the ego boundaries come down, in this case, when a person falls in love, the sense of the ability of one, one to do almost anything begins to rise up again. We and our beloved are one. Loneliness is no more. In some respects, the act of falling in love is an act of regression, because we're going back to the way we experienced life at age one, two, three, four, where we had almost no ego boundaries, and we had a sense of omnipotence. When we were merged with our mothers in infancy, along with the merging, we also re-experienced the sense of omnipotence, which we had to give up in our journey out of a childhood. All things seem possible. United with our beloved, we feel we can conquer all obstacles. We believe that the strength of our love will cause the forces of opposition to bow down in submission and melt away into the darkness. Right? That's that's what people feel. And now it's it's I think it's so important for us to understand the the marriage of the removal of the of the of the ego boundaries with the sense of the ability to do. The future will be all light. The unreality of these... Uh, okay, so now the unreality of these feelings when we have fallen in love is essentially the same as the unreality of the two-year-old who feels itself to be the king of the family and the world with power unlimited. 
So that's well, what, what I've happens. gathered from this. Yes. I want to be two again. Yes. Well, that's the, well, and that's what that's what I'm going to get to. If we can have a few more minutes on this, the the real gift of loving others in truth, it gives you the superpower. It ability. gives you exactly. It's a skill that needs to be developed, but then you go back also but that's the to gift the my sense of my ability me, to do. Honestly, exactly, exactly. So I just want to to close this out. He says. Sooner or later, in response to the problems of daily living, individuals will reassert themselves, right? And that's what happens. There's, why do people fall out of love to some degree? It's because at some point, the ego boundaries are built up again. Because you can't, unless you're truly working this of spiritually, aware, yeah. not go back to your nature of your ego boundaries. So, for instance, he says, um, she um, she wants to go to the movies. He doesn't. He wants to put money in the bank. She wants a dishwasher. She wants to talk about her job. He wants to talk about his, and so on. So the ego boundaries snap back into place. Gradually or suddenly, they fall out of love. Once again, they are two separate individuals. At this point, they begin to either dissolve the ties of their relationship or to initiate the real work of loving. Exactly. So... I'd like to, uh, maybe I'll, we'll stop here because I do want to um, speak about how he talks about the importance of growing yourself through true love. But for me, the importance of this of this concept and this podcast is for our listeners to understand that the love that we're talking about is not romantic love. It can be a part of of, of the love that you have in a relationship. But love that is not dependent on what you're receiving on, from somebody else. Love that is an expression of your truest self towards another person for their good. I mean, this is how we should navigate our entire lives with everybody we come encounter with. I mean, that's how we're meant to live, truly. Absolutely, absolutely. And and the beauty of this, you know, you, I, we often like to tie it back to the benefit, is that when you live in this way, when you are actively pushing yourself to act, think, and act in love towards others from whom you are not expecting to receive in return anything, you yourself are growing. And as a matter of fact, it is the most important work for which our soul came into this world. And that, I think, is is another important element here. You know, there is a famous uh, section in the Talmud, and it is actually based on a verse in the Bible. What is the most important precept, what is the most important purpose? So the great Kabbalist Rabbi Akiva said, which is the verse that says, love your, your, neighbor. your neighbor, your fellow man as yourself. That is the most important purpose of, call it the Bible, call it spirituality, call it life. So the question, what that means to me is that the question we have to ask ourselves, if I accept that the purpose why I'm in this world, if you're a spiritual person, certainly if you're a religious person, is to become a greater lover. But in this sense, we mean lover of, of people. Humans, yeah. Are you really doing that? A lot of us can be good people, and 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 growing in love takes effort. Growing in true love takes effort. It is not something that comes naturally. It is not. It, it, I want to just the caveat. It is our essence. Yes, and it is our. But it is our covered instinct. by our ego boundaries that we have to fight against. It is actually the most pure part of our essence. But but it is. I mean, I think it's as hidden. natural as learning to walk, talk, play. It's all of our desires. I mean, love is right there, up there. It's a basic human need. Right, but but if you think about, it, I think for so many of us, and certainly probably many of our listeners, we have muddled what we think of as romantic love with love. But also, I think we go around covering our, you know, we don't want to be hurt again, and we don't want to be disappointed, so we are withholding, we want to protect ourselves, so we are defensive. I mean, I think that we spend a lot more time trying to protect ourselves from hurt than actually being able to give and receive love, which takes vulnerability. And most people, that, that word still has a bad connotation, which, vulnerability, to be vulnerable. Right. Right, but but it's, the truth is again, you have to be in the love that we're talking about and, and expressing it. Yes, there is vulnerability, but but it's less than I think the romantic love vulnerability that that is necessary. Right, it does take effort to. You to think go it's to your more friend. in in romantic love vulnerability or less? You, I think I think 
you are more vulnerable when you're in a relationship with somebody who you're hoping is your... I don't think so. I think you have more opportunities to be vulnerable, but I don't think that that's true. I think that you can choose to be vulnerable every... In fact, there's opportunities to be vulnerable every day of your life, whether you know you are sitting with somebody who is dying or you're you know helping somebody who um, lost their job or if you're apologizing for an error you made. I mean, we have opportunities all day long to actually remove barriers and create connection. Right, right. I just think that when assessing where the greatest potential hurt can come from, I think the greater hurt can come from a, a romantic relationship because we have much more hopes. And like if I have a friend or somebody I know um, and I and I'm and I desire to show and I push myself to show them love and more and more love, and if they for whatever reason don't take it or or don't accept it or don't reciprocate, um, I'll be less hurt than if my partner or the person that a person is dating and hoping will become their partner breaks up with them. I think right, that's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. Based on this, I, and I think this is um, the foundational understanding. He goes on to explain how we grow by growing in love, growing in love towards other people. The experience of real love also has to do with ego boundaries, since it involves an extension of one's limits. It's a very important understanding. But what we're talking about here, we're not just, you know, showing love, you're saying a kind word. There has to be an expansion, a, an uncomfortable expansion of your own limits, is really how you're growing in love. One's limits are one's ego boundaries. When we extend our limits through love, we do so by reaching out, so to speak, toward the beloved. But limits, you're saying expanding our, um, I don't want to say vessel, but I want to use a layman term, expanding our ability to. What are you expanding yourself? So, for instance, let's say I know this person, I even have a relationship with them. For me now to think of ways that I can better their life, for me to now think of ways that I can give them love, I'm now expanding myself outwards towards them. I, as if I'm actually building, taking down the wall between me and Your them. arm is their arm, the extension. They're now within my boundary. Mm-hmm. And that's how we should view love. That what we do with love is we're actually expanding ourselves to now include more, even things, but certainly people. So, which I think is a beautiful way to, th- to think about it. And, and again, for our listener, I hope that this is how we start pushing ourselves to, 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 to love more. In other words, we must be attracted toward, invested in, and committed to an object outside of ourselves, beyond, beyond the boundaries of ourselves. And he uses an example, which I think, a very important example. He uses an example of gardening, right? So here we're not even talking about people, right? We're talking about things. But hopefully by understanding gardening or the love that one has, can have for gardening, we can understand how we are supposed to be growing in our embracing of and giving of love towards others. It all goes back to nature, by the way. Like, I'm thinking why yes. this example, but the truth is, I mean, nature is always the, the number one obvious thing to mimic. Yeah, and to learn from, absolutely. Let us consider a man who gardens for a hobby. It is a satisfying, consuming hobby. He loves gardening. His garden means a lot to him. This man has worked on his garden. He finds it attractive. He has invested himself in it. He is committed to it. So much so so that he may jump out of bed early Sunday morning to get back to it. He may refuse to travel from it. And he may even neglect his wife for it. In the process of his love, in order to nurture his flowers and shrubs, he learns a great deal. He comes to know much about gardening, about soils and fertilizers, rooting and pruning, and he knows his particular garden, its history, the types of flowers and plants in it, its layout, its problems, and even its future. Despite the fact that the garden exists outside of him, through his focus, it has come to exist within him. And I think that is so beautiful and powerful mm-hmm. as, a, as a foundational way to understand what it will mean for us to truly love another person. His knowledge of it and the meaning it has for him are part of him, part of his identity, part of his history, part of his wisdom. By loving and focusing his, on his garden, he has, in a quite quite a real way, incorporated the garden within him. And by this incorporation, his self has become enlarged and his ego boundaries extended. 
So you can do I, that with anything. You can do that with anything and with anybody. But I think, again, I, I think this is a very exciting and fundamental thought about life. That our purpose is to diminish our ego boundaries, and to expand ourselves. And how do you do that? Through love. Love manifested through thought and action. Mm-hmm. So I think there are many people out there who think, and you know, speaking even to myself, I love people. You know, I share with people. But not how many thing. people are in your boundary? Let's and just them. this person with, with <laughs> you know, their history. You take care of them. You wake up excitedly on a Sunday morning to try to do something better for them. But this is the purpose of life. This is the purpose of life. And again, the beautiful effect of this is that as you expand yourself and you bring down your ego boundaries, you will become more powerful. You will go back to the two-year-old in thought who believes he or she can do anything. Powerful in terms of your influence and yeah, your... what you believe about yourself. So I think the, the 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 to realize the again maybe there are people out there who are so spiritually evolved. It's not about that, being. It's honestly that was the other understanding I had, and I know you agree. It's not about being spiritually evolved. To really live this, you actually have to under you have to understand love in a completely different way. And really ask yourself the question: What are you doing to expound your boundaries? What are you doing to diminish your ego boundaries? Why? Because this is actually why you're in this world. And think about it. This week, this day, not not even so much with your partner, not even so much with your children. Again, there's a lot to be spoken about, the love that needs to be even grown there. But I want to specifically talk about the garden. I want to specifically talk about your friend. I want to talk about somebody who may be not so close with yet. Our purpose in life and that's why the great Kabbalists say in the, in the Bible, the, the most important verse that it is, the foundational teaching, love. But not love as unfortunately, unfortunately, we've all muddied the understanding of this love that we're talking about, mm-hmm. the love that is outside of us, the love that it makes us ex- remove, diminish or remove our ego boundaries and make us greater. Because now, when you're truly invested in loving another person, then you are actually expanding yourself. And in a deeper way, and this is uh, based on spiritual teachings, you actually draw great light and blessings. There's very few things that a person can do in his or her life to draw blessings that we desire, that we need, than the manifesting of love towards other people. And now we, I think, begin to understand a little bit why. Unadulterated love, this pure right. love. Right. I think that's why people are so attracted to children, just watching them play and be in that energy. It's because they're connected to this that Absolutely. we are not. Absolutely. And by the way, as I was reading this, one of the reasons <laughs> why we know that children in the womb and even in the early stages of, of, of life in this world are much more connected to truth. Because what they the, the lack of ego boundaries and the 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 sense of omnipotence, that's much closer to who we truly are. And all the stuff that we that we put collect up, later. We collect. <laughs> so, and then to to end this, I, I just read the last paragraph here, which again I think is both inspiring, hopefully for our re- readers and and for us. What transpires then in the course of many years of loving, of extending our limits, is a gradual but progressive enlargement of the self. You know, and this is the paradox, right? Because the ego wants us to in, in, enlarge ourselves by only taking from ourselves, when in truth, the only real way to enlarge ourselves by is, by, is by bringing other people into my ego boundary. It's interesting. And, in, and incorporation within of the world without, and a growth, a stretching, and a thinning of our ego boundaries. In this way, the more and longer we extend ourselves, the more we love, the more blurred becomes the distinction between the self and the world. We become identified with the world, and as our ego boundaries become blurred and thinned, we begin more and more to experience the same sort of feeling of ecstasy that when, when that we have when our ego boundaries partially collapse and we fall in love. Mm-hmm. Only, instead of having merged temporarily and unrealistically with a single beloved object, we have merged realistically and more permanently 
with much of the world, a mystical union, in quotes he calls it, Mm -hmm. with the entire world may be established. And that, I think, is the purpose, not I think, I know is the purpose of life. And, And my hope is that our listeners become excited by this, because the, the the purpose of this podcast, certainly this one, is not to hear a nice concept, but you know, how am I going to now live differently? And I could say for myself, I, I I I'm even thinking of ways and things that I that I will do to to live more in love. Really, what are you gonna do? I think it's 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 about, but there's actually two, and the first one is a little bit more complicated. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. But but really focusing in our relate, we we all have relationships with, with other people. It could be a two minute relationship. Even for example, somebody you you come across in the world, somebody asks you for directions, right? You can say there's a few options. You, you know, they could say no, I'm not going to help them. You could say yes, I will help them. The third, which is I think the most powerful, say I will show them lo- show them love. You're doing the same thing. You're showing them directions. You're taking the time, but it's coming from a different place from within. So every you. single exchange is an opportunity to love more. Exactly. Exactly. It's interesting. It's today, I when I was working out, I ran into somebody I hadn't seen in a really long time, and her mother um, also had Alzheimer's, and her mom just passed. I, I, there's so many parallels. I keep meeting people in the same kind of boat, but she was sharing how her mother's birthday and her daughter's birthday is the same, and her birthday is five days later, and she just found out her grandmother's birthday was the same oh, day. Wow. So I started talking, and I was like, so I started sharing all this stuff about tikkun and and reincarnation, and she kind of just looked at me, and as I finished, and I was like really like excited to share with her because I thought it would help her, she kind of just looked at me, and I thought to myself, well, I'm not sure what she thinks of this. She might hate everything and disagree with everything I just said, and I still I wouldn't care, but for a second, I felt a little awkward. And then she's like, I have chills all over my body. <laughs> so like for me, it's like I'm always going to try to help somebody in some way, even if they didn't know, <laughs> if they don't fully want it. And I think, and again, the, what I would add to that is, and and what I would say to you and to me is that actively have it come from a place of love. Oh, well, it did, because I wouldn't I wouldn't okay. have done, I mean, because I know for me, what I said was kind of like out there. And I, I don't think, I mean, I really just really genuinely wanted to make her feel um, to have some kind of understanding that she didn't have. But yeah, it did come from love. But I do want to just break this down for our listeners a bit more because I do think about so many who have broken hearts still um, from, again, not having healthy attachment styles with their parents. They never received love or maybe the love was attached to some kind of outcome. You know, if they were a good child or they had good grades, then they would get love if not the parents were withholding. And we see this a lot with people across the board where you know, they can be so successful and really doing, you know, a very great job, being a great parent or in any box, right? But they judge themselves or they can't see themselves because they don't love themselves because they never received love from that one person. And sadly, they go on through life, even in their 50s, 60s, with that narrative and that story. I, I, I can't really love myself or give love or receive love because I never got it from the one person I wanted it the most. So for those people, where do they actually start? I think for you and I, thank God we're in healthy places with love. Um, And I think that we helped each other in a lot of ways um, really learn to give and receive love because we were vulnerable with one another. So what, what do people do when they don't have that and they haven't started in that way? Do you have a suggestion? Because I I think... Well, I think the first thing is... We talked about this a little bit in the last few episodes that for you know, so often people are unwilling to um, even mourn a parent or you know, they're still hung up on what that person should have been or should have done for them. So I think the first place is to start and really say, you know, everybody's just doing their best and it might not be great. It might be sometimes pitiful, quite honestly, but it's their best, right? And you know, that doesn't help. No, but if you look at where they came from, you know, what I'm saying, it helps you forgive them, but it doesn't help. No, but you have to start with that space, right? In terms of um, learning to love yourself, again, if you've never experienced that, I think that you need to, what I would do is I would look at people who are healthy in that way and I would kind of model what they've done or what they're saying and learn to do that for myself. I know that that is all learnable, 
for sure. I wouldn't wait for somebody else to offer that. It has to start. And from I think there. and it, one one of the actions because by the way, by the way, as much as my father loved me unconditionally, I did go down a very dark road of not loving myself, starving myself, right, to nearly to death, and then learning to love myself, right. So I actually did what I'm suggesting for our listeners to do. I knew not to settle for anything less in terms of what I was going to receive. I still had to learn to build it up for myself. Right, right. And what I was going to say is that I think one very practical action, and we've spoken about this with different people, is that one of the ways that we awaken love is by doing actions of care, right? We've been talking about other people. But for some, one of the ways to build the love for oneself, especially in situations where growing up, for whatever reason, that baseline wasn't created by the love received from parents, is to actively, actively give love, do actions of care and love towards oneself. Sometimes, and we, unfortunately, sometimes it's very difficult for people to do that because of that lack of baseline of love that they did, did not receive. And the negative stories. Right, but I think, and, and this is related to everything we spoke about, that, that when you understand that loving is a skill that needs to be developed. And, and one of my favorite quotes is that real love is permanently self-enlarging experience. Mm. That, that, so you can, every one of us, no matter where we are, and from the lowest place of loving ourselves or others, we all have to be growing in that. And it's a learnable skill, especially since at our essence we have it. That is probably the truest part of who we are, that we love ourselves and we love others. But again, which we is have why to we have this up. battle all the time within of I want to receive love, but I can't receive love. I think I'm deserving, but I'm not good enough. Right. We have that because innately we all have that within us, but it's covered with these false belief systems. Mm-hmm. While you were speaking, I was thinking about that cartoon or the animated film Trolls, right? It's like all happy and they're color. One person's not in color. I think he's like blue or gray. And then they awaken it through love and his heart, and then he's all the colors, right? I mean, I know it sounds kind of cheesy as I'm saying it out loud, <laughs> but that is in essence what we all need to do, and we can. Absolutely, and we, and again, I go back to this because I think it, it really frames it in the proper way. This is the most important thing that we came to this world to do. The most important thing. I think a lot of people, you know, think about it. You know, it's it's a nice thing, or you know, I have love in my family. I have love in my. This is every human being came to this world, and the ultimate state of any one of our fulfillment is based on how much love we are giving towards others, how much we are, again, in these terms, reducing our ego boundaries and growing the the, the, the amount of love that we're giving towards other people. So in, in a certain way, it's a very, uh, I don't want to say selfish, but it's the right way to go about life if you want to be happy, if you want to be fulfilled, if you want to have blessings. There you go. Yeah, so I really, again, like I, like I we said in the beginning, I really hope for ourselves and, and for our listeners, that we are inspired to actively pursue love, because it is the, the path, and then again, it has to be uncomfortable, it has to be uncomfortable. Real love must involve the thought of our own growth. Why am I, why am I pushing myself today, tomorrow, to give love, love towards other people? Because I need to grow. So I need to grow. And it's okay if it's foreign, you know? Everything, everybody starts yeah. out as a stranger. Yeah. But, but it's thing. not really foreign to your essence. No, but it might right. be foreign into what you understand, what you're, look, people can be comfortable with all kinds of horrible things. It's what they're going to, right? right? And that's why they choose negative partners and negative situations, because it's what they know. You got to go against what isn't working for you and to tap into what's really true. Yeah. Do you have a letter for us? I do have a I letter for us. I love when you surprise me. Yes. What's and again, <laughs> um, uh, get back to our listeners to uh, please send in and your letters, letters, write to us, comments, five star. What do you say? Five, five star, star reviews. reviews. That's it. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's usually when I check out. <laughs> I hope our listeners aren't checking out. This is a very important letter. Very important. Okay, dear Monica. Well, and now Michael. they're paying attention. Yes. By the way, you want to do it again? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> do it later after after I read the letter. No, dear Monica and Michael. Uh, I'm very new to Kabbalah, and I started listening to your podcast recently. In addition to reading Monica's book, Rethink Love, if you haven't bought Rethink Love, <laughs> go to Amazon right now and order your copy of Rethink Love, as well as a few others uh, from the Kabbalah Center. It's remarkable how tangible, practical, and thoughtful your messages are, making complex concepts easy to grasp. Thank you. Your podcast, No Regrets, as well as a portion of Monica's book, Rethink Love, regarding the world-renowned violinist playing during rush hour in D.C., really struck chords with me. 
and help me have a breakthrough this week. During the day, I now reflect on the messages I am learning and how to transform and embrace light and try to be an observer of my general thoughts during the day and to identify my tikkun, what I need to correct. My initial week of doing this was shocking. Exclamation point. I couldn't believe how often unsubstantial thoughts of criticism or judgment came up on my walks around London. I don't even consider myself a very critical or judgmental person, <laughs> but apparently my filler thoughts between thoughts beg to differ. I actually err towards the compassionate healer side of the spectrum, but what I've uncovered this week is that COVID has really impacted my perceptions of others, whereby I now have a slight apprehension of or fear of others and find myself judging people who aren't following distancing COVID rules or similar courtesy. On my walk last night, I found myself judging someone who walked too close to me or riding a bike too closely on the pedestrian walkway, despite there being plenty of room across the sidewalk. Fill in the re- relevant critical thought here. Once I passed them, I almost immediately came upon a small family where the father was pulling his child away from me to avoid me. (laughs) I realized I was so wrapped up in my thoughts judging someone else that I was guilty of the same in the next moment. Wow. That observation hit me hard. I'm not sure if you experienced this in New York, but living in London, I've realized that when you're outside amongst others, most people wear headphones now, myself included. So whilst we're around so many others with the opportunity to connect and share light, we tend to block everyone out these days and build a sound barrier and therefore disconnect. I also recognize that even when we do have time in our day, we never really do in our minds. We're often on a mission going from point A to point B as efficiently as possible to complete our tasks and don't stop to smell the roses or listen to famous musicians playing in public transit along the way. I'm on autopilot most of the time I'm coming to realize. And with a pandemic, I'm on autopilot and also afraid of strangers getting too close or even coming near me these days. When I realized this, I shifted my gear from automatic with a serious voice of the opponent narrating my life without realizing to manual, to take back control of my thoughts and my life and stop being a jerk, which was as such a shock to witness within my own thoughts. Just like listening, l- learning to drive a manual, I'm stalling a lot, but continuing to listen to your weekly podcasts and wider support from the teachings, and immensely, they are immensely helpful. Thank you for sharing your insights, lessons, and learnings with the community. I am so glad to be a part of this community and for the first time in a long time, feel more connected to the light and more hopeful each day. Your lessons helped me peel off the layers I didn't even realize I had added in adulthood, and I couldn't be more grateful to you for providing this wisdom and a path to light the way in the right direction. Wishing you both all the best, and thanks again, Ashley. That's so beautiful, and thank you for being vulnerable. Right, and sharing this with us and with our listeners. But and see, that is an extension of love. Exactly, and that's why exactly I thought it was so interesting. It. It, because we get, like we, get, that, we get letters that are sort of, um, you would assume, or think not connected, obviously, to the podcast that we're recording today, and it seems it's exactly like it right. Fits in. And this is because of, this is exactly what we're talking about today, because love, what is love? Love is about bringing down the ego barriers. Love is about expanding our... Uh, ourselves. And that's really what Ashley's talking about. So yeah. thank you, Ashley, for sharing with us and for sharing with all of our listeners. Thank you to all of our listeners. And as uh, we often mention, and now Monica's <laughs> making fun of me, do it, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, Make sure to send your letters, questions, stories, thoughts, questions, feedback. thoughts, <laughs> feedback. <laughs> to Monica and Michael That's at Kabbalah. Monica and com. Michael at Kabbalah.com. How do you spell it? <laughs> Monica A and D. Michael. Oh, right. I forgot that part. At Kabbalah.com. Go to Apple Podcasts, give five star. Or wherever you hear your podcast. Yes. It could be Spotify. It could be anywhere else. Apple. There too. That's All what I right. mentioned before. <laughs> <laughs> Support this podcast. Share it with your friends. We do this because of it's people fun. like Ashley, <laughs> also that but also because we know that there are so many people all over the world listening to this podcast, whether, and, and I think many of us, many of our listeners know this, it's available in Portuguese, it's available in Spanish, it's available in Hebrew, it's nice available add on, in Michael. English. <laughs> <laughs> we are very inspired when you share your stories with us, so please make sure to continue sharing your stories with us. It continues to inspire us, and I hope we continue to inspire you, and I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. As much as we enjoyed getting it. Recording it. Close. Uh. <laughs> Bye.